Hey, again, just along with everybody else, we just welcome you. We're so glad to, to see you. I'm glad to see you, people in the room, and everybody that's watching online. Hey, this week, I was, um, I was driving along. It's on I-30, in fact, uh, and a three-lane road, you know, lots of lanes. And I was driving along, and there was a car coming up, coming up behind me. Uh, there, were, there were no other cars on either side of me. I was just driving along, cruising. I was going at least the speed limit. And we're cruising along. This guy comes up behind me. And he's like, like drafting me, like, like it's NASCAR or something. And so I thought, well, I, I can get out of your way. And so I looked in the rearview mirror to go one way lane or the other. And uh, he, he showed me one of his fingers. Uh, he was, he's like, I think he was telling me like I was number one in his life. And he loved me. I, I was sure that he was affirming me for driving so well. And so I, I just like, okay, wow, all right. So I, I moved over and he just zoomed past me. And I thought, man, this guy, like he wanted to get somewhere fast, evidently, and I was in his way, right? And I thought this becomes like this kind of picture, proverb, um, parable of our lives. We, 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 we are an impatient people and we want to get somewhere fast and uh, someone or something is in the way. And so today, you can imagine, we're going to be talk about, talking about patience today, and we're looking at, of course, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, and we're memorizing this together, okay? Galatians 5, and 23, we all know it now, so let's all say it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. That is to say, this is freedom. This is the way that we're to live. It's the fruit. We've said it's not the fruits. It's the produce. It's what the Spirit is producing in our hearts if we're following Jesus, right? So we look different than the world. And, and this is such a critical piece right here with all that's happening in our world today. We said that every, all of this is a response to what Christ has done for us. So it's grace in the waiting is what we're talking about here, all because of the grace of God towards us. So I want to ask you, if you've been with us, many of you are, are brand new today, are you living? Are you applying the message? Are you loving? Are you, are, you, are you more joyful this week? Have you been living with peace, the fruit of the Spirit? This week we're going to talk about now patience, all right? But like all of our messages uh, these messages, we're resourcing you big time around the sermons with questions you can ask in small groups or in your family or in your quiet time. And you can see another, yes, QR code there that can help you get there. All this is on the website too, but you can find it right now if you want to look. Questions that you can ask. And if you're online now, uh, you can, yeah, just put it on your screen there and on your uh, camera and it'll show up automatically. Uh, we, want, we don't know where you're coming from. If you're with us online, just drop in the chat there and let us know. I want to say hi to you. We're so glad that you're with us today. Encourage each other in the chat um, as we go along. Uh, James 5. I want you to turn to James 5. If you're at home, grab your Bible. If you have uh, here in the room, grab, grab your Bible. And we're going to be looking at James 5. I'm going to jump to Galatians 6 here in a moment. So don't let me throw you off too bad. Uh, James is the, core, is the key passage that we're going to walk through today. This is one of the earliest books in the Bible. i got to set this up because, you know, we're taking things out of context um, can quickly become a pretext that's not really what, this, what the writer's saying. He's writing to, uh, this is one of the early, if not the earliest book in the Bible. He's writing to, to Christians now, Jewish Christians, who are in exile, yet again, Jews in exile, but this time they're Christians in, in the Roman Empire. Well, we've talked a lot about that this summer, if you've been with us. Living in exile in a very secular, non-Christian culture is what we're looking at here. And so the letter is basically a remix of Jesus' teaching specifically on the Sermon on the Mount. And if you know much about James, he has a bias towards action, right? Like, look, like let's don't play. So let's do this. Let's, let's obey this. Let's do this. Or your faith means nothing. And, of course, he's spot on. It's the Word of God inspired by His Spirit. This is such a relevant word for us today. To be patient uh, is arguably, I think, the way that a watching world will know that we belong to him. Think about it. It's the way in our culture today in this political season that you kind of stand out, right? Biblical patience, though, 
is, is not what a lot of us think that it is. Biblical patience is actually translated forbearance. It's, it can be translated endurance. The best, I think, is what King James calls it in Galatians 5 in the list is the word long-suffering. Long-suffering. That gets to the heart of what we're talking about with patience. That's a word we don't use a lot. But that word, it, it's this quality of self-restraint. It's, it's not giving up or giving into anger is a big part of it. Or when you're being enticed or annoyed. This is a good one for us, you know, young. Like if you have a sibling, you're so annoying. This is, this is what it is to respond to someone who's actually enticing you towards anger and challenging you. We don't see any of that in, in the political season right now. But we, we need to practice this kind of patience, right? So what does it look like? This is the question I want to ask today. Real practical, because that's where James goes. Very practical. What does patience look like? And I would say, first of all, patience looks like the pineapple. Okay? Now, James doesn't say this. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this. Um, the pineapple. And here's why. We're, we're applying a fruit, a real fruit, to fruit of the Spirit and remembering when we see it, Whenever we eat it, you're going to remember, ah, yes, that's patience. I need to practice patience. And so the pineapple is a model of patience for us in a couple of ways. Do you know how long it takes for a pineapple to grow? It takes a long time. It takes two to three years. Do you know how many pineapple grow on a pineapple plant? How many? One. If that plant grows, flowers, bam, there's the pineapple, and check it out. Brings forth this beauty, dies. Kind of a parable of life, right? And so it also takes a long time to get in this mug. I mean, this is like you, you're like, I, I mean, how many, how many of you in the room, I can't see, well, online, you can, you can raise your hand. How many of you actually buy a pineapple like this and you, all right, more, wow. Okay, so I'm the impatient one here. Uh, many people in the room are saying, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't you want to just buy it already cubed, cut up? Thank you very much. And like, bam, I'm in. Uh, I mean, and, but it's, it takes a long time to get into this thing. It takes a long time to grow. Um, but oh, how it's worth the wait. This is probably easily my favorite fruit in terms of taste. Nothing like the pineapple. And, and so all this patience toward this beauty is worth it all. We're going to talk about that today. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not simply waiting. You need to get your mind around this. It's not waiting for all the pain to go away. We think of patience too. I'm going to be patient until that person <laughs> is out of my life. I'm going to be patient until that thing happens. I'm going to be patient until all this struggle goes away. It's not surviving. It's not making it through one more day. It's not making it through another week or month. It's not making it through the pandemic. That's not what biblical patience is. Biblical patience, you see, is not simply um, something in time, okay, a place in time. It's always something we reveal in the moment. So we're going to unpack this a little bit because it is a powerful concept. And to get it right will change your life. If you listen to this message and apply it, it'll change your relationships, change your marriage, change your family, change your friendships. It will change your life today. And here's what James says. Patience looks like a farmer, all right, looks like Job out of the Old Testament. And we're going to land, it looks like Jesus. Patience looks like Jesus. Again, James 5, these Christians, Jewish Christians, are struggling hard, all right? And in order to understand where James is heading with this, you've got to understand where he's been. This is the fifth chapter, so he's, a lot has happened already. What he's been doing is admonishing wealthy believers who are very confident in their own ability, all right, to determine outcomes, ROIs, control their lives by this perceived power that they have because of their wealth. And then he goes to the other side of the spectrum, and he says to the poor people, don't uh, envy or desire the rich riches of the wealth. And he says this, because all of us, all of us need to focus on something else. And that something else is the key to patience. So we're going to unlock this power of patience, the key. Apparently, these wealthy Christians even, were using and abusing their wealth, making life even more difficult on those who didn't have much. So they had no concern for economic equality. So James is calling them out, a kind of what we call cultural Christianity, a form of faith, right, in Christ that conveniently removes the way of Jesus, particularly when it comes to issues of justice, partiality, advocacy for the poor. And he's saying, no. James is calling for real action. In light of that, okay, that's the context. 
which is important to understand. He will say, be patient because your patience is going gonna, is gonna to pay off. And so first he says, patience looks like the farmer. All right, look at verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth? Being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now look at this. The farmer is waiting on a goal. This is important to understand. He's waiting on fruit to sprout. He's waiting on something to happen, something restorative, something that's going to flourish. Patience, again, is enduring pain, right? It's enduring suffering, even attack. It's enduring a challenge, whatever you're going through these days. It's enduring a loss, difficulty, knowing that there's a greater end coming. I'd say it this way. Uh, patience is not just getting through something, but growing through something. Like the farmer watching the plants grow. How about this? It's receiving through something. Patience is actually receiving through something. Now, how long do we wait? Look at what he says. Until the coming of the Lord. Now, immediately you might think like me, like, that could be a long time, right? Not necessarily. And not when we think about what does it mean? What is this coming of the day of the Lord? Because watch this. This is, a, this is an important concept. Help me this week. It's not just a marker in time. The day of the Lord, which is this coming of the Lord, okay? The, re, the return of Christ, where all of history is heading, where everything is going to be made right. This is, what, this is what James is getting to. There's a judge. There's a just judge in all things, all of your challenges, all of the suffering, all of the challenges, you, all the oppression, everything you're going through is going to be made right. This hit me this morning while I was coming here. Uh, it, it was this. We're all impatient because we're longing. All of the universe is waiting, is what Paul talks about, right? We're all waiting for the day when everything will be made right. Nothing in this life will be perfect. And we're all waiting on it. Our relationships. I wish my kids were perfect. I wish my spouse would you know, wake up. Whatever. And we're waiting. We're waiting when it'll never happen until when Christ comes and restores all things. And then everything will be made new. So all of life is waiting. I say it this way. It's not just a marker in time. It's a goal. And so think about it this way. If you're going to go out and run 26.2 miles, that's a distance, but it's also a goal, right? It's where you're heading. It's like a road trip to California. It's a distance, but it's also a goal. The goal is the coming day of the Lord in our lives, and it's the goal of all of history. It's like we're caught up in a river, this momentum, this already moving, everything is going that way. Once you receive Christ, you're, you're headed that way, and he will make all things right someday. And James is saying that should impact how you wait. Now, in the moments, in the little things and the big things, because the big thing, the big day drives everything else. I can trust in the just judge who's going to make all things right because he, he will take away all oppression and struggle and I live with hope. I could say it like this. Patience is qualified in both a measure in time or of time and in a measure of trust. Your patience, watch this, proves where your trust lies. It proves where you think about it. Where are you impatient? With whom are you impatient? Where do you lack patience? It shows a lack of contentment. In your life, it shows that you want to power up on people and change them. I wish you would change. Like some of you here, young parents, I wish my kids would grow up. They're in preschool, okay? This may take some time. You might think, well, they're in high school. This may take some time. This is going to take a while. Sometimes we demand of others what they can never give us. Again, whether it's a spouse or a friend or finding peace in Christ allows us to act with patience, especially if our desire, here it is, is to be patient like the Lord. Patience begins with God's patience toward you. And it's Christ who personifies this. I, I, I'll say it this way. Patience is not just the ability to wait, but how you act while you are waiting. Again, it proves where you place your trust. And again, we try to take, take control of people. We're trying to change people 
Nobody in your life's going to be perfect. And check it out. If your family suddenly is perfect, well, you blew it. You're not. Okay? Uh, you know, I've read so many books on courageous leadership uh, through the years. I've never read a book on courageous patience. And sometimes it ta- as a leader, as a person, and you know, you've got to be patient. We, ha- we often pray for strength. Many times we pray for strength. What we need to pray for is patience. Because it's in the patience that we prove where our trust lies. So James says, hey, look at the farmer because he's trusting in something outside of himself. Did you catch that? The early and the late rains, which was the cycle in Palestine. And, and he works hard in the harvest, but there are outside sources that he has no power over. This is true in your life. All of the Christian life is one of waiting, proving that we trust in him. So what are you waiting for? Are you waiting on the right things? That's worth thinking about. I mean, are you really waiting on godly things? If not, no wonder you're impatient. Because those things are not what God desires for you. So we reveal our trust to everybody around us. Because we're patient both in what we're waiting for and in how we are waiting. All right? So we, I want to spend some time on the farmer. All right? Because I know so much about agriculture. I'm like a farmer. Um, I actually know scripture. So I want you to do this. I want you to turn to Galatians 6. Because this is a, um, and I'm going to a little, little sermon within a sermon. We'll get back to James. But Galatians 6, we see what we call the, the, the law of the harvest. In the law of the harvest, we learn a lot. It's yet again natural laws that govern the natural universe that parallel with spiritual laws that govern our spiritual life uh, in Christ and with God. All right? So he says this in Galatians 6. We'll go 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. He's saying, uh, can I say it? God don't play. He does not play. And if you think you're in charge, God has the last laugh. He will not be mocked. He is the one in control. So don't fool yourself, he's saying. God is at work. And then he says this. Whatever you sow, okay, whatever seed you put in the ground is going to come up later. No farmer worth his salt is going to, going to put a watermelon seed in the ground and say, where are my peaches? You're not going to put an orange seed in the ground and say, where's my apples? Nobody. Who does that? How about the person who wants to grow in Christ sincerely Never opens their Bible. You're doing that. What kind of seeds are you sowing? How about the person who wants their kids to grow up godly, loving Jesus, and you're not pursuing Jesus? You want to teach your kids to pray so that when they're out of the house and they're gone, you know, you're, they're going to call on the Lord. They're going to have him and not you. And that's going to be an all. And you're not modeling that for them. You're not planting seeds. Don't expect a certain plant to come up if you're not sowing seeds. Don't expect to get an A on the book you didn't read. Don't expect God to move if you're not planting seeds. What are you sowing in these days? See, in the waiting, we're all waiting. All of life is waiting. Don't expect God to answer your prayers if you're not praying. And we wonder where he is. I've said it recently. Don't tell me God's silent if your Bible is closed. What kind of seeds are you planting? into your mind, into your heart. And, and so we got to plant wisely. And I want to say this. Some of us, here's the way you plant. Plant yourself in a community of believers, godly people pursuing Christ. I mean, you, you've got to do life with other believers. And, and this is a, friends, I want to tell you, this is good soil. This church, this body is good soil. Let us help you connect. What kind of seeds are you sowing? Some of us are in habitual sin, and we're trying to get out out of habitual sin, but you're not in accountable relationships with anybody. You're not sowing seeds of accountability and growth in your life with people who can help you. We We need to enter into life with others. What kind of seeds are you sowing? Look at verse 8. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Look at this. There's different types of seed. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Sowing to the Spirit will from the Spirit receive eternal life. What do we do while we wait? What are you doing in these days? Well, we sow seeds, clearly. We sow seeds. We plant seeds of the Spirit. Did you catch that? From the Spirit, then. Fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Real life coming forward and coming forth 
in our lives. Like a seed, there's more going on here than meets the eye. When God plants his seed of faith in us and we're able to trust in him, he gives us the truth. We, we say yes to him. He starts to do this great work in us. I love this. Look at verse 9. And let us not grow weary. This is a word for some of us of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. So what are we do in the waiting? Patience means we sow seeds. It's active waiting and we persevere. He's saying, don't give up. No farmer, again, goes out, plants seed. How about this? Plants one day, goes out the next day and goes, where's my crop? No farmer does that. And no farmer tosses one seed out in the field and goes, where's my bumper crop? It's the amount of seed and what kind of seed you're planting. But he waits patiently, again, on outside sources to work. The soil, the water, the sun. All that God is doing, and listen, some of you need to hear this today. This may take a while. We're wondering, why is my friend who just came to Christ a couple months ago, why are they not more like Jesus? This may take a while. You didn't get to where you are over time. The same way with our our children. This may take a while. Don't give up. Don't give up on people. In due season, God's doing his work, you see. Don't give up. I've been reminded in this season, I've seen so many it's been such a hard season. So many who've challenged. I've seen people who have who've spun out, been burned out, been sent out. I mean, it has been a difficult time. And, and understandably, so it's like everything can happen in a decade, happen in a year, right? And I would just encourage all of us here. Many of us have been struggling, but in many faces I'm looking at right now, and then you online, so many of you. I just encourage you to to don't give up. And I would say this. If Satan can't take you out in 2020, he can't take you out. You're still standing. Sometimes you just need to stop and you say, I'm still standing. I'm still here. I'm struggling, but I still, God, I still love you. I'm not there yet. And he goes, I know, but I'm still standing. It's why in Ephesians 6, 13, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. He's saying, after you've done everything you can, just stand. Just stand there. Somebody needs to say, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. I think of young parents during this season with kids at home or young moms. You know, you're, uh, it could be the dad, but you've got a house is a mess, laundry's piled up, bills are piling up. You know, your spouse is not helping you a lot. Uh, you're not at your best right now, but you're still standing. At some point this week, you need to just, rem- just I'm still standing. I'm still here, God. I'm still here. Our students who've been through the crazy wrap up of last school year into a crazy season this year, just, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. Single adults, you've been alone maybe for, and way too much. Not with your regular pattern of friendships and such. You're still standing. And I think of our adults. I think of, gosh, some of our senior adults who literally have been alone. All alone, unable to go out. I just want you to say, if you're watching me right here, I'm, I'm still standing. Praise be to God. I'm still standing. And so look at verse 10. So then. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. What do you do in the waiting? You sow seeds, you persevere, you do good. We talked a lot about that. We do justice. We love mercy. We walk humbly with God. Doing good is doing like Jesus. That is doing good. He says then, let's go back to James. All right, jumped you over there. I want to look at the farmer. Look at James 5. James 5 verse 8. It says this, you also, so he's saying, like the farmer, okay, also, be patient, establish your hearts, there it is, stand firm, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, this coming of the Lord, we'll talk more about that in a moment. How do we wait? Look, he says so in verse 9, he goes on. This is James. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold. The judge is standing at the door. Now watch how he's he's tying patience. And we're thinking of, well, I'm I'm trying to be more patient in my relationships or in the way I drive or whatever it might be. I'm waiting on this date or something. But he's he's tying our patience with the coming of the Lord. And we, we feel like there's a real disconnect here. But here's what he's saying. Even in the waiting, that's ultimately what's driving us in all of life. It's a goal. 
that we're moving towards. He says, don't grumble. This word grumble, the, the, word, the word grumble is, is kind of the proverbial rolling of the eyes. Um, but it's more than that. It means to moan, literally. It's, it's what we may have done when you look at someone and, and the, you have a disdain towards them is what happens. Again, I got to go there. During this political season, we have an opportunity to stand out, to be different. Because here's what happens. This is the attitude that looks at other people without the dignity and the honor that they deserve because they have been created in the image of God. Whether you agree with them or not. They are created in his image, every person, and God loves them. It's thinking and saying disparaging things about another person, uh, and we're seeing this like crazy. It's labeling other people. And, and can I just say it? It's like, you're a Republican. No. Right? There's a D after your n- No, ma'am. We, we just write people off immediately grumbling against the person because they're not aligning with our political party. And we have an opportunity again to stand up. And friends, I can tell you that to the degree that politics are making you crazy these days is to the same degree that you are putting your trust in politics. And Christians stand out because we're the ones who love all people regardless of where they land. We see dignity and worth in every person. And we have an opportunity to bridge the gap, right? So we, we operate with kindness, with gentleness, with the stuff of the Spirit, knowing that no political, political party will ever replace the kingdom of God. And, and, and so we, we, we know that the kingdom doesn't rely on political plans or strategies either. We've talked about this a lot. Listen, the Christian has the opportunity to say, I serve a different king. He's already on his throne. I mean, he's, he's already voted in. And he's my king. He's my master. So we enter into politics primarily to help others, serve others, and to represent Jesus in the public square. How are you doing? How are you doing with that? And one of the most powerful ways we can do this is in our speech, the way that we talk, right? This is how we exhibit our, our patience. It's through our conversations. And, and just, this is with anybody. Primarily with those in our families or those closest to us. How are you doing? Sometimes patience is exhibited in the way that we listen well. That we're just listening. See, we've said that uh, Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath. How are you doing with a gentle answer? And watch this. Sometimes the gentle answer is silence. You don't have to answer everything you disagree with. Do you know that? We don't ha- you don't have to do that. You can, you can suspend that. See, and the believer has this with patience. We, we, we have the capacity to suspend judgment on people. And we can even live, watch this, this is for some of us, we can live in unresolved problems and relationships. We can live with, with tension and not impose a quick fix on messy situations. Some of us have to deal with that for a lifetime. Rather, because, you know, here's the deal. We live in light of God's judgment and salvation. There's a judge who is in charge of all things, and it's not us, not you. We have the ability to cultivate mutual understanding with people and to live differently. Look at verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord. And then he says, okay, consider the farmer, but watch this. Behold, verse 11, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. That's how he ends this section. So he says, look at Job. I mean, look at the farmer. He says, now look at Job. And he's assuming now we know the story of Job, right? Of course, Job, we know this much. Job is the epitome. All right, the example of patience through suffering. You talk about long suffering. This is the story of Job. We've talked about this a lot here. It's actually a story of worship at the beginning of the whole story, right? He's, he's seen as the most blessed man on the planet. And then Satan asks God, okay, but does he worship you because of all you've done for him? Or does he worship you because you're God? How would we know, right? There's only one way we'd know, one way to know in your life. Take everything he's got and let's see how it goes. And then we're, out, we're not out of chapter one, game on. And that's what happens. The whole book of Job is then him remaining faithful. Yes, raging, questioning, 
arguing with God, but, but staying in the game, still standing. Until the very end, he says, at the end of the book, he says, I'd heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. As if to say, I didn't get all my answers, but I got God. I got you through it all. Through his patience, he saw another goal. And even Job, it's wild. He talks often about the judge and the end of time when all things will be made right. That's what's driving him. He says, I'm hanging on. In the middle of his struggle, he says this in Job 10. You have granted me life and steadfast love. This is for all of us. And you care. Your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you hid in your heart. I know that this was your purpose. These things in your heart. He's saying, I didn't know about this. I couldn't see all that you were doing. And so he says, but you, you had a purpose in it all. Friends, God has a purpose in all that you're going through. So James tells us, he says, you don't know what patience looks like. It looks like the farmer. It looks like Job. And I'm going to end with it. It looks like Jesus. He says, look at God who is is loving and compassionate. He's the one who is compassionate and merciful towards you. Look at this. Again, patience in your life begins with God's patience for you. For us to understand that, receive that. And to be patient, we fix our eyes on Jesus, who was patient throughout all of his life, and even patient as he endured the cross, the shame that went upon him that should have been ours. Friends, listen, Jesus went to the cross for us so that we could have a relationship with him and know that he is the just one. Ultimately, we wait for our ultimate salvation that has already taken place, is happening, and is to come. And there's coming a day when one big moment, one big day is coming. The coming of the Lord is one place in time that all of history is moving towards and your life is moving towards it as well. And so it's the goal. I mean, it's a destination time, but it's also the goal of our lives to be made like Jesus, for him to transform our lives so that we become just like him. And that one big event changes every little event in our lives because we're waiting on that day. I could say it this way. The pineapple ultimately is the coming of the Lord. It's, it's the return of Christ and it's, it's, it's in the moment that we get to, in the times we obey him and follow him, we are, we, we're, we're getting a taste of the pineapple before it comes. And we get to help others get a taste of this kingdom to come when a new earth, heaven and earth unite and a resurrected people on a resurrected earth will worship a resurrected savior. That's where all of history is heading. And that is the goal of our lives, and it changes everything. And so here's the ironic twist as I close. Here's the urgency. There's, there is urgency in the waiting. I'd say it this way. Some of us need to hurry up and wait on the Lord. You need to hurry up and wait because, listen, when he comes again, friends, listen, when Christ comes again, it's closing time. Game over. He'll bring the keys and it'll be, there will be no time left to make a decision for him. And all that will matter is whether you know him or not. I was standing at the graveside this week. And with all that we could say about this man's life and wonderful life he lived, all that mattered was did he give his life to Christ or not? Because now he's in eternity. There's coming a day when Jesus will separate the sheep from the goat Goats, those who've, who have received him, those who've decided they're going to rely on their own power and goodness to get to heaven. And he's going to say, you go that way, you all come with me. Do you know him today? Because friends, here's how I want, uh, listen, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. And if you're watching me here or you're here in this room, this is why God has you hearing my voice right now. Look at what it says in 1 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness. But is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He will not wait forever. He's waiting on you to repent. I mean, some of you might think, man, I've been waiting on God. No, he's waiting on you. And today's the day. 
So here's what I want to do. I want us to close our time in prayer. I want you to just bow your head. Will you do that with me? Just bow your head and close your eyes and watch it online. We've got hundreds of people, thousands over time that will watch this message. And you're watching right now. If, you're, uh, if you don't know for certain, friend, that's why God brought you here today. To listen to this message. To hit this link or click on this sermon. He's calling you. He's calling you to repent. Which is just turning away from your own life and turning to Him. So give Him your life now by an act of faith. Say, Lord, thank You for waiting on me. Wait no more. I give Him my life. Every one of us can pray that prayer. Lord, wait no more. I trust in You. I give You my life. Thank You for dying on the cross for me. Thank You for settling my future. Thank you for making me whole. Lord, we give you our hearts and our lives. We praise you. We love you. We know that you are. You're the way maker. You're the one. And we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.